Come on through, and we're going to get started. Eventually. I need to do a page. Bing bong. Paging Abel Rob. Abel Rob and the rest of the worship team, if you could come to the front of the stage. Boarding now. Harrison, do you want to go find Abel? Like, hey, Abel, Dad's, Dad's, Dad's open. Hello, Rihanna, how are you? Good, how did you sleep? That's good. Pardon? You can sit on one of those seats, sure, that's fine. It's fine. Oh, because they're both on, aren't they? Oh, fun times. All right, here we go. That's it, let's stand to our feet this morning, church. A big welcome to Activate Christ Church. A big welcome to everybody watching online as well. Hey, why don't we take a moment just to lift them up this morning. If you feel comfortable to just lift a hand, this is something that we do in church. It just represents surrender. It represents that we're saying to God, hey God, you're in charge this morning. We're just letting go. We're handing over this morning to you. So Heavenly Father, we just give this morning to you. Lord, we surrender this morning to you. We say, Holy Spirit, come and have your way in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Awesome. Thank you, God, that that is true, that we are not alone. Hey, grab a seat this morning, church. Hey, if you are a guest with us this morning, it's so cool to have you here with us. I'm Josh, and uh, along with the team, uh, lead here at Activate. Big hello, of course, to everybody watching uh, online as well. Uh, we just got a couple of notices uh, to do this morning. Uh, first thing, I've had a lot of people ask how the cafe is going. Uh, those of you that call Activate Home will know that Liz and I opened up a, a gelato cafe out in Rangiora in December, and people are like, how's it going? And it's going well. It's been a real challenge. It's been some really long hours, and it's been a test of my patience at times. How many people have heard the saying, the customer is always right? Well, I hate that saying. I was in the cafe the other day. I was sitting at a table. There's an old lady at the table next to me. And it's about 4.30 in the afternoon. It's a very gloomy Wednesday. It's dark outside. And I thought, you know what? We should probably have the lights on. So I called one of the staff over. I said, hey, can you just flick the lights on? Which she went and did. The old lady at the table next to me says, ah, oh, 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 it's too bright. She said, this is clearly not an eco-friendly cafe. I said, oh, well, the, you know, the halogen bulbs, the... They don't use that much power. If that stresses you out, you should see the freezers. Um, and she goes, and another thing, she said, the chocolate in your stressier teller is too big. I said, you, you're complaining about too big chocolate in the stress teller. She says, yes. And another thing, she said, I found a piece of lemon in my lemon, lime and bitters. And I wanted to say, are you sure you didn't find a huge chunk of bitters, you old heck no. She said, I found a piece of lemon. And I said, oh, well, you know, we do put lemon. And she says, someone could choke on this and die. And I said, well, it hasn't happened yet. And then on the inside, I thought, but maybe. <laughs> Today's the day, Lord. <clears throat> so that's kind of the life of being a cafe owner. It's, it's going well, but keep us in your prayers because as the weather turns and the holiday vibes end and people go back to routine, then people aren't as enthusiastic about going out and just walking down gelato. So we certainly have noticed you know, a change in that area. So keep us in your prayers. That's great. But just so you know, it's, it's going well. God is good. Uh, it's a fun adventure to, to be on. Um, notices for church this morning. Uh, we have got, first of all, if you want to be kept in the loop with what's happening in the life of the church, then just jot your name down in the information station out the back. Email address, phone number if you want, and we'll keep in touch. We're going to try and get into the habit, the good habit of sending out an email once a week just to keep you in the loop with what's happening. And we put updates on the, uh, the Facebook group as well. So jot your details down there if you want to be kept in the loop. Uh, we've got prayer meeting coming up tomorrow night. So down here, 7 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to be down here tomorrow night. I'm trying to get down here semi-regularly, which I haven't been able to do since the start of the year with the cafe and stuff. But tomorrow, I'm letting you know now, Mostly so I do it, so I come, right? Otherwise, how many, peop how many people are like, I'm going to go to prayer meeting? And then it gets like 6 o'clock Monday, and you're like, uh, is it just me? Yes, and Marla down the back. Yeah, Kerry, that's right. So, you know, tell someone today when you're all feeling excited, I'm going to go to prayer meeting tomorrow night. I'll see you there, and then you've got to come. So prayer meeting tomorrow night, it's, it's awesome. Hearing some great feedback from that, and I want to be a part of it. Uh, another thing that's coming up in the life of the church, we've got youth group happening this week. We had our first youth group uh, a fortnight or so ago, and the kids loved it. They came back buzzing. So if you've got youth group age kids, that's uh, sort of years seven and above, so kind of like 11 and 12-year-olds up, uh, then let us know, and we can plug you into that on Tuesday nights, which is awesome. And then the last big thing, this doesn't really apply so much to guests, but if you call Active at Home, you will want to know about our roof plan. 
So we've been talking about needing to get the roof replaced for a long time. We've got some quotes in. Here's the deal. We have signed a quote. We are going ahead, uh, which is important because even this week, the, the ceiling in the new mum's room collapsed again. It's just shocking. Every, every time it rains, a, a ceiling falls in somewhere, the disabled toilet falls in. And maybe you don't notice because you're not using the disabled toilet or the new mum's room, but it's, it's a big problem. Uh, and so we are getting the roof replaced. So there's some things that you need to know. First of all, if you want to contribute to the cost of that, if you feel like God is saying, hey, I want you to sow into that, that would be awesome. You just make a deposit and you just code it as roof and we'll know that that's what it's for. It's going to cost in the vicinity of between one hundred and forty dollars and $150,000. And that was the cheaper quote that we picked. There's a couple of things that are included in there which I won't bore you with, but we've got to make sure that there's enough room for insulation in the ceiling, partly for warmth, but also because if it rains and the ceiling is too close, then the, the rain hits the color steel and it just sounds like a huge you know, torrent of rain every time it rains it a little bit. So we've got to try and protect ourselves against that. So about 140 to 150K. Uh, if you're wondering, well, how much money do we have? We have about 140 to 150K in the bank account. So once we pay for the roof, we're, we're sort of back to square one. So any contributions, if God moves your heart, that would be appreciated. Uh, it means that we can't use this building for around four to six weeks because there's no roof, right? Now, what are we going to do? We talked as a team about just sort of reverting to our lounge church model for four to six weeks. Uh, but I, I didn't feel that was the right thing to do, and neither did the team. We felt that it was important that we continue to meet together over this time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pivot, which is a bit of a 2020 word, but we're applying it in 2023. We're going to pivot to a Sunday afternoon service, and we're going to meet at City Church on Manchester Street. They have given up their premises for us to use on a Sunday afternoon. So our first Sunday there, you'll get all of this information well in advance, but our first Sunday there is the Sunday after Easter weekend. So we'll be in here every Sunday up until Easter Sunday. And then the next Sunday, we will be at City Church for three Sundays in a row. And then we're going to have a lounge church, as we always do. And that'll be four weeks, and then we'll see how the roof is going. And if it takes another couple, we'll continue to meet there. Four o'clock in the afternoon is when we're going to be meeting. Because we need to give them enough time to finish their service and get out, give our musos enough time to get in and do a bit of a rehearsal because they can't practice down here during the week because there's no roof, right? And there'll be other things that we need to shift to, like prayer meetings and staff meetings and youth group and all that stuff. We will, we will be in touch. But just letting you know, up until Easter Sunday, we're here. After Easter Sunday, we're going to be meeting together at a different location for a couple of weeks. Give me a wave if you understood that. If that made sense. Oh, great. You're all good. You smart people. Fantastic. All right. We're going to say goodbye to our kids this morning. Jump up, kids. No rush, Jess. Just take your time. It's fine. We'll wait. We'll wait. Just, we're just waiting for Jess, everybody. Just took her a while to stand up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Why don't we reach a hand out to the kids this morning? Let's just give them a blessing as we do. Father, I just bless every child in this place. I bless them, Father. Uh, Lord, I just declare and release over them this morning an open heaven. Lord, let our children challenge us when it comes to their connection with the Father. Let them challenge us when it comes to the deepness and richness of their relationship with you. Lord, let them challenge us when it comes to what they are unlocking in the Spirit. Lord, I bless our children, and we just declare that our ceiling will be their floor in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Right, powerful. All right, out your kids go. If you're a guest with us this morning and you've got kids, you can just take them out the back, follow around. We've got programs running for sort of ages three and up. We've got a self-catering creche out the back. And our new mum's room uh, today is in the office. There's a sign on the door and uh, you can just see there's baby stuff in there. Don't go into that new mum's room because the ceiling will fall on your head, which we don't want. All right. We're going to enter into some worship this morning, but here's what I want us to do. Uh, I want us to come together. I don't, I don't want this big empty space in the middle and people's prayer. Let's come together. Let's worship 
together. Let's worship with our, our Christian brothers and our Christian sisters. Let's worship in unity. So Amanda was just thinking the same thing. You know, let's, let's, here's what we're going to do, church. Let's physically represent what we're going for in the Spirit. What we're going for in the Spirit is unity. We're going for oneness. So why don't we physically represent that this morning? Spiritually, we are together. Spiritually, we're brothers and we're sisters. The Bible says that we rejoice when each other rejoice and we mourn when each other mourn. We're supposed to carry each other's burdens. We're supposed to be there for each other. So let's come together. Come on. Don't make me point at people and say, you move, you move. <laughs> come together. So many empty seats in the middle. Yeah, you can come up front if you want. You guys are like, oh, it's so scary. I have to move seats and sit beside someone that I see every Sunday. But normally I see them from over there and now I have to see them like this close. It's terrifying. That's it. It's a bit better. I tell you what I can see. I can see still lots of lots of space in this middle section. Lots of space. If I were like hypothetically on the side, I'd hypothetically I'd I'd look to move in. Hypothetically. Well, here's the thing, Jean. I feel like I've been pretty pretty clear if I can't force people. Can't force people to. Very good. I'll say this one thing and then I'll and then I'll leave it. And that one thing is that there is still space in the middle. Just before we uh, move into worship, just checking with Holy Spirit. One of the things that we pray every Sunday morning in our in our pre-service prayer meeting, and, and often pray it even you know when we open the service, is that is that the Holy Spirit would have His way. And we pray in the pre-service prayer meeting that you know we say things like, "God, you're in charge. God, you're in control." We don't want to run to a program. We don't want to run to a a pre-organized run sheet. We just want to come together and worship you, and then see see where that leads us. So we're just going to wait a little bit. We don't normally wait in this part of the service, but we're going to wait a little bit here. sing right now. Hold on. I, I just uh, get a real sense of God's love and that He wants everybody up here, not in the pews. He wants everybody active. He wants everybody up the front. He wants everybody to come right in and receive from Him this morning. 
receive a greater dose of his love, re- receive healing, receive, receive, receive. That's what I get this morning. So don't be shy. Come up the front. Come and worship in unity. You know, come right up the front here. This is what the aisle at the front is for. Receive ministry from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Don't stay where you are. Come on, it just takes a step forward. Come on, everybody, everybody, come and receive from the King, from the King of Kings this morning. From the King of Kings, come and worship Him with all your heart. Everybody, come on, unity, unity. Let no one be left behind. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, come on, let's worship together. Peace like a river, wash over me. the 
Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. A move of your spirit. Heaven, break out. Come now in power. Cover this land like you've done it before. Would you do it again? Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. A move of your spirit. Heaven, break out. Come now in power. Cover this land like you've done it before. Would you do it again? Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. A move of your spirit. Heaven, break out. Come now in power. Would you cover this land like you've done it before? Would you do it again? Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. A move of your spirit. Heaven, break out. Come now in power. Cover this land like you've done it before. Would you do it again? Heaven, break out. Here's what I think. Here's what I think God is saying in this in this space. Uh, Anne came up to me at the start of this morning's service and she said she had a picture last Sunday uh, or an impression. She wasn't sure whether to share it or not, so she held on to it. But I actually think it's for today. 
And the picture that, that Anne had was, there's a story in the Bible where Jesus is having dinner with some Pharisees, some religious leaders, and a woman comes in with an alabaster jar filled with very expensive perfume, and she breaks the alabaster jar and pours the perfume over Jesus' feet. And the Pharisees see it and are offended by this display of passion, I guess, love, just surrender. And, and they say, we could, have, we could have sold that perfume. It's a year's wages. Like that's a lot of money to just break over someone. And as we're singing that song, you know, heaven break out. This is what I heard God say. He said, I can't break out until you break out. And this picture of the alabaster jar, he said, look, until you are prepared to surrender everything, You know, Paul talks about, you know, I have this and I have that and I have this and, and I have that, but I count all of it as loss. Like none of it, none of it matters to me compared to my relationship with the King of Kings. And there's two different ways that you can come at that story. You can come at that story from the woman's perspective who just said, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to just extravagantly love Jesus I want to give him every part of me. Or you can come at it from the Pharisee's perspective and go, that seems a bit OTT. A little bit bordering on inappropriate even. Here's what I want us to do. You don't have to do anything in this place that you're not comfortable with doing. So I want to make a suggestion and you can decide to do it or not do it. But Denise, you can jump up because I know that you've got something to say. But we're going to just take a moment, in a moment. And I just want you to really ask God what it means for you to break your equivalent alabaster jar and pour out the contents to Him. Denise, what have you got? Um, be, before the service, um, Anne and I were praying and Anne also got a, a vision of um, Egypt and the promised land and, and the Lord breaking open the waters to walk through. And when Jean said to come forward, um, I felt like that was the beginning of us walking to the edge of Egypt and we're looking out through the Jordan River and the Lord has parted the waters and it's a decision time, what Josh is just saying right now, before we lay everything down before the Lord, we need to let go of the past and we need to let go of the things of Egypt that we're ready to let go of Egypt and let it, let it, you know, to walk across and to, to come into the promised land and to shut the door to the past. When those waters cross back over, they couldn't go backwards. And I think the Lord's saying today, are you willing to surrender? And I think we've taken that first step as a congregation and individually and as a congregation, we've taken that step to the edge and we've gone, yep, I'm, I've, I've come this far, but I'm not quite sure what to do. And I feel like this is a time as before we lay, or as we lay down our offering before the Lord, part of it is gonna be the old, the self, the stuff, and just offer it to Him first. And that's gonna be part of that, that actual um, breaking open that alabaster um, jar of, of everything that we carry inside of us, the good and the stuff that we that we need to let go of so that we can step into that promised land, that we can we can step into the things that God wants us to step into. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I want you to find a space, just however much space you need. If you go, look, I just feel like there's not enough space up the front with all these people, then I don't mind. Go, go stand right down the back. Just find a space. You can sit on the stage, you can sit on the steps, you can come up here. And just you and God. You and God, I, I want you to, in all authenticity, 
come up with an answer to the question that he's asking, which is, will you give me everything? And ask the Holy Spirit to highlight for you maybe the areas that you're holding on to that you need to let go so that you can step into this new season in your own time. church I was um, I was a little bit apprehensive maybe was even the word about coming to church this morning because of what God was talking to me about during the week if you want to grab a seat grab a seat we're just going to stay in this space you guys can just park it here grab a stall for Kira I'm going to just get you to keep playing though okay because it's nice and spiritual and I think what we might do is I might, I'm just going to share a little bit from here and then we might we might go into a bit of worship I'm really I'm really not sure what's going to come out Um, I 
a couple of things that God was talking to me about during the week, and and I was like, I was wrestling. I was like, God, is this something that you want me to talk about in church, or is this just for me, or is this not even you at all? This is just me thinking about stuff. And because if it is you, and it is something you want me to talk about in church, it's it's very, it's quite heavy, God. It it borders on almost a little bit of a rebuke. And how many people believe that Jesus loved Peter? Like he loved Peter. You look at the interactions that Jesus and Peter had. I think Jesus loved Peter. And at the end of it all, Jesus, you know, trusted Peter with the birth of the church and to run the church. But the Bible says at one point, Peter makes a comment and Jesus turns around. The Bible says Jesus rebuked Peter. So we have precedent of Jesus rebuking people that he loves. And he does it because he's trying to encourage and elevate and grow their relationship with him. In other places in the Bible, it says that, you know, uh, that he, the father disciplines those he loves like a son. And, and one of the ways that we can tell that we are sons and daughters of God is that he loves us enough to reach out and say, hey, we need a bit of a course correct here. And it's always because he's trying to correct us towards him. He's trying to close the gap between us and him. He's trying to deepen our relationship with him. Any discipline that we receive from God, any rebuke we receive from God is him saying, I want more of you. And this is what he said to me uh, during the week. I was talking with Steve McCracken when he was here, and Steve McCracken made this comment. This is a prophetic guy that we had in the church a couple of weeks ago. He was in his church back in Melbourne, and he was due to get up and kind of lead the service a little bit like I am now. And he felt like God said, hey, when you get up, here's sort of what I want you to do. And so Steve did what a lot of us do when we know we are about to get up. He started to, in his mind, kind of just think about, well, how am I going to communicate that? Sort of thinking, I'll get up and I'll say this and I'll say that. And so in his mind, he said, when I get up, I'll say, hey, God's inviting us into X, Y, Z. And as soon as he said it, God said to him, don't say I am inviting you into this. I am instructing you to enter into this. He said, stop watering down my instructions and calling them invitations. And then we just carried on with the conversation, but man, it got to me because that's language that I use a lot of the time. It's just a little bit less bossy from the front. You know, hey, God's inviting. I feel like there's an invitation here, this, or an invitation there. But this is what God said to me during the week. He said, there are people in this place, I am probably one of them. Usually, in fact, I don't think God's ever said there's people in this place and it hasn't applied to me. It's kind of lame. He said, and you are watering down my instructions to an invitation because if you say no to an invitation, you are just declining something. If you say no to an instruction, then you were disobeying. And he said, there are people, Christians all around the place that are not comfortable with admitting to themselves that they are living in disobedience. And so they water down my instruction to an invitation that they can say no to and then say, well, I'm not living in disobedience. I've just declined a particular invitation from God. Does that make sense? And so what I felt that God was saying is to just like that be honest with yourself just be honest with yourself I need to be honest with myself there are there are things that God has said to me hey you should do this you should do that and if I'm honest I've probably put it into like hey God suggested that That was a good idea that God had. I should do that at some point. That was a good suggestion, God. Oh, that's a nice invitation. Yeah, I might take you up on that at some point. And God's going, these are not suggestions, Joshua. They're not like 
good ideas that I'm just sort of throwing at you for you to decide what you pick up and put you down. I'm telling you to do this. And if you're not doing it, you are living in disobedience. How many people here, you don't have to show your hands, but how many people here, you're like, I know I, that God has said, do this, do that, stop doing that, stop doing that. And I've just kind of parked it as a like, hey, that's a good thought. I might get to that at some point. Hmm. Here's, here's what God was saying to me, particularly yesterday. I believe, I don't know if I've ever said this from the front, but I believe that we are on the cusp of the single greatest move of God that the world has ever seen. We are in what I would call the birthing stages. Anyone who's ever been around birth or had birth, you know what happens is you get this contraction and it lasts a very short amount of time and then it stops. And then there's just a long space. And then you get another contraction and maybe it's a little bit stronger and it lasts a little bit longer and then it stops. And then there's space. And this process goes on for quite a long time. And as it goes on and as it develops, the contractions get stronger and longer and the space in between gets shorter and shorter until eventually it all kind of clashes and collides and now the baby is on its way and you're delivering a baby. You guys understand that? What we are seeing around the world at the moment are birthing pains of the greatest move of God. The other day I was on Facebook wasting my life Another suggestion of God that I've ignored. Just get off Facebook. And I'm like, God, I need Facebook for the business and people message me and I'm just an idiot. And I'm, I'm scrolling through Facebook, not doing business stuff, and uh, a post comes up about the Asbury Revival. Who's heard of the Asbury Revival? A few hands going up. Right, I had some friends that were over there, some ministry acquaintances and they had taken some photos. They'd taken a little bit of a selfie. I'm not even sure if they were allowed to do that. And the, the post that they had said, uh, that they'd written said, Revival, Revival is here, Revival. And I read about it. I was like, that's cool. And then I scrolled up, and the very next post was some friends of mine, some ministry acquaintances that passed through a church in Melbourne. And the headline said, Revival, Revival is here. And there was a video of the pastor just doing a piece to camera walking down the road. And I, I clicked on it and I watched it. It was like a minute long. And he said, we started our church service on Sunday night. It's still running 60 hours later. We can't get people to leave. We're just rotating staff on, staff off. But it's just, for 60 hours now, this service has been running. He said, I've never in my entire life seen anything like it. I'm reading comments on the post from people saying, I feel like I wasn't even a Christian before I came to the service. Like that's how unique and different and exciting this atmosphere is. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Two revival posts in a row. And then I scrolled up and then there was another, and I'm talking like no gaps in between, just bang, bang, bang. There's another post from someone who I don't know from a bar of soap and I don't know why I'm friends with them on Facebook. I think I went through a stage once where I just accepted every request that came in and it was some random person that I don't know. But anyway, there was photos of a whole bunch of hundreds, thousands of people in a river in the Philippines. And the post said, revival is breaking out in the Philippines. Thousands of people being baptized. Revival in the States, revival in Australia, revival in the Philippines. And this is the start of what God wants to do. Now, I don't know what it'll look like. I don't know how long this process will go on for. And, and I, I don't probably want to go into the full details with you because it's very personal. But I am, I am absolutely convinced based on a word that God gave me many years ago that we're going to see something extraordinary, unbelievable in my lifetime. My life, I'm 40 years old, so we're not talking in 100 years' time. Maybe 50, I don't know. But it, it, at some point in my life, I, I believe at church with every, every fiber of my being. I, you will never, ever be able to convince me that that's not going to happen based on this word that God gave me. Maybe one day I'll share the context for it because if you understood the context and what was happening at the time, you'd be like, okay, that's, 
You can take that to the bank. I talked last Sunday about becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Who was here last Sunday? Maybe not. Who was here last Sunday and paid attention? It's like a different different question altogether, right? And so we kind of, we got to this point where we define discipleship as, uh, you know, someone who actively imitates Jesus Christ until they become a living copy of Him. That's discipleship, actively imitating Jesus Christ until we become a living copy of Him. And I talked out of uh, Luke chapter 14, and I just want to go back there a little bit. You know, in the Hebrew language, they don't really have adverbs. Adverbs are words that we use to attach to verbs and adjectives to kind of assign extra meaning to them. So an example of an adverb would be the word really or the word very. So for example, if I said, I'm hungry, you know that I'm hungry. But if I say, I'm very hungry, now you know, well, he's, he's got more hunger than I thought he had before. Like I've added a bigness to it. Or if I said, I am tired. Oh, poor Josh. Is, well, if I said, I'm really tired. Okay, so that really is an adverb, right? They don't have that in the Jewish language. In the Jewish language, if they want to kind of make something bigger, then they repeat the word. So if, in the, if, it's, if a Jewish person says shalom, that means, hey, peace. But if I want to communicate to Chris a big piece, like a, a huge piece, an all-enveloping piece that, that impacts his entire life, I will say, shalom, shalom. I repeat the word because that then adds emphasis. And that's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to repeat a couple of things that I said last week because I actually think that what Holy Spirit wants to do is focus us in on it and He wants us to recognize that there is a heaviness and a weightiness to what was shared last week that maybe we didn't pick up on. Does that make sense? Luke chapter 14. I'm just going to dial into the story real quick. Jesus is just walking along the road. If you read the context, he was hanging out with some Pharisees. He wasn't doing anything overly spectacular. He's left the Pharisee's house. He's on his way to his next appointment. He's moving from point A to point B. B. This is something that we see Jesus do every day of his ministry life. It's typical. It's normal. He does something here and then he leaves and he goes somewhere over here. It's an ordinary day in the life of Jesus. If I can use the word ordinary to describe any day in the life of Jesus. And the Bible says that crowds were following him. This is also normal. This is also an everyday occurrence. Anytime Jesus went anywhere, crowds of people followed him. You know, women with issues of blood would have to fight through the crowds to touch his garment to be healed. He'd turn up at a place and there's 5,000 people there wanting to be fed. There were crowds always following Jesus. This is nothing out of the ordinary. So Jesus is leaving point A to go to point B. Normal. Crowds of people are following him. Normal. Every other instance in the Bible where crowds of people follow Jesus, we see him respond with patience. We see him respond with kindness. We see him respond with compassion. We see him respond with love. Even when the disciples get frustrated and grumpy, like, oh, there's people everywhere. Jesus is like, hey, chill out. I have compassion on them. They are sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is always patient with the crowds, but not in Luke chapter 14. Something triggers Jesus. And we don't know what it is because nobody says anything. Nobody does anything. As far as everybody in the area is concerned, we're just following Jesus again. He's going from here to there like he does every other day. Let's go with him. Let's see what he does. This is going to be a great time. This is going to be fun. We're probably going to see a miracle. Maybe we'll get a free feed. It's going to be awesome. And then all of a sudden, Luke 14, out of nowhere, Jesus turns around and says, hey, if you don't hate your parents and your family, you can't be my disciple. Like out of nowhere. Just put yourself right in that moment. That would have shocked them. Jesus has never acted like this before. He's never said anything unkind. He's never said anything uh, in, in a crowd context like that. And out of nowhere, we wouldn't even do anything to him. We were just we were just following along behind him. And he's just turned around and said, Unless you hate your family, you can't follow me. And then he says, unless you're prepared to pick up your cross and carry it, you can't be my disciples. It's like, what 
did Jesus get up on the wrong side of the bed this morning? Like, what is going on? And then he tells a story about, you know, budgeting before you build a house or a building and making sure you've got enough money. And then he says, in the same way, you've got to count the cost before you decide to follow me. In fact, you can't follow me unless you give away everything you have. What's happened there? Why would he do that? Do you know what I think it is? I'm just speculating because it doesn't say in the Bible, but I just wonder if Jesus in that moment was just walking along, hearing people chattering and laughing and talking behind him and what's Jesus going to do next? And, you know, what, what's he going to multiply this time for food? I mean, did anyone bring anything better than fish and bread? We should have brought some KFC. You can multiply that. And, and he's hearing all of this chatter and something inside of him just goes, you know what, guys, you don't know what you're signing up for. And in that moment, he turns around knowing that his crucifixion is coming, knowing that his sheep are going to be scattered, knowing that the vast majority of people following him are fair weather followers, knowing that the vast majority of people following him are following him for the show. They enjoy seeing what Jesus does. Maybe they're following for the food. If we follow Jesus, he's going to feed us miraculously and we won't have to worry about sorting ourselves out. Maybe they're following because it's just a great vibe and all their friends are following him and so they're following him as well. And Jesus just goes, guys, you, this is not okay. And he turns around and he says, hey, if you actually want to follow me, it will cost you everything. It'll cost you your relationships. You're going to have to lay down your pride And he said, everything you have, unless you have the mindset that everything you own is not yours, you can't follow me. And I think that Jesus, in that moment, he was like, guys, there is a time coming where the rubber is going to meet the road. And you're going to find out that you haven't built your house on solid ground. You've built it on the sand. And when the storm comes and the persecution comes, you're just going to get blown away. And here's what I felt like God said to me during the week. He said, I want you to say that again because there is a time coming. There is a test coming. We're on the cusp of the greatest move of God that the world has ever seen. And you better believe that there will be a reaction to that. I think that we are coming into a season. I was talking to a pastor on Friday and he was sharing with me a podcast that he'd listened to by a, a very well-known Christian strategist, church strategist who gives advice, you know, all around the place. And this church strategist said that when you look at all of the metrics available to us, and he's talking about America, but we're pretty close to the States. When you look at all of the metrics available to us, he said society and culture in America is now closer to pagan Rome than it is to our historical Christian roots. It has shifted so far that it has more in common with the environment that Jesus was living in than it does with our Christian roots. Uh, and then we talked about another stat he'd read where he said, look, in its heyday, America identified up to 80% Christians. It was a Christian nation. He said, New Zealand has never got above sort of 20 or 30% at its peak. And so you could even argue that Christian uh, New Zealand's never been a Christian nation. Well, this is what I felt like God said. I felt like God said, hey, there is, you are about to enter a new season and in the past, up until this point, you could get away with having your cake and eating it too because there was a certain alignment between culture and Christianity. But that alignment is not there anymore. And you are entering a season where you will have to choose between following Jesus Christ or prioritizing your existing relationships. Because following Jesus Christ, following the Word of God, following what God says is going to become so radically unpopular that you will lose friends. Potentially, you'll lose family members. He said, we're coming to a time where you will have to be prepared to lay down your life because what I ask you to do is so dramatically different from what everybody else is doing. And he said, you're coming into a season where you have to be prepared to give him everything you have, surrender it to Him and say, look, God, every, everything I have, every resource I have available to me is, is for you. 
And I felt like he said, I want you to share that with the church on Sunday. And I was like, well, that's going to go down well, God. But all I can say is that I'm in this as well. This is not me saying, hey, I have it all together. You guys suck. I'm not saying that at all. Right? I'm saying all of us are in the same boat. And I was going to say it's an invitation from him, but I don't think it is. Let's drop that language. This is what God is telling us. This is what Jesus said. If you read Luke chapter 14, there's no hint of like, hey, this is optional. Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm inviting you to be my disciples. He said, if you want to be my disciple, this is the deal. This is the deal. And like I said last Sunday, if that's not something that we want to do, then I think it's worthwhile stepping back and going, well, what am I doing here? Better things to do maybe on a Sunday morning, on a sunny day, if you don't actually want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I think there's a big difference, and I touched on this last Sunday. There's a big difference between, on a ch- in church on a Sunday, preaching Christianity and preaching Christian values. Who's heard of VeggieTales? VeggieTales is awesome. I love VeggieTales. I still remember the first ever episode I watched. I was at my grand's house, and I'm not sure why I was there, but our whole family was there. A VeggieTales episode came on, and Larry the Cucumber was on a psychiatrist's couch talking about his lips. And I, I laughed so hard that I cried. It was just hilarious. And I will periodically break into, you know, where is my hairbrush and all that kind of stuff that Larry the Tomato sings. The guy that invented VeggieTales is a man called Phil Vischer. And he invented VeggieTales and he developed VeggieTales and he voiced a lot of the characters and he wrote the scripts. And then the business kind of grew too big. They made some bad decisions. They got in trouble. They got sued by another company. And he ended up going bankrupt and losing everything. VeggieTales are still on TV, but he's got nothing to do with it. He lost the rights. He lost the creative input. And I just, I read an interview with him the other day and he was reflecting on the 10 years that he was involved with VeggieTales. And he said this, and I thought it was fascinating. He said, I realize now, looking back, he said that there is a big difference between teaching children Christian values and teaching children about Christ. You can teach people to be kind and to be patient and to be generous, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ crucified. And he said, I, I look back on those 10 years with regret because I didn't teach young children about Jesus Christ. I just taught them how to be a nice person. And sometimes I wonder if we fall into that trap in church. We just focus. We, I think a lot of churches sometimes are nothing more than just behavioral modification units. You know, people come in, they're not Christian. We're like, hey, that's okay. God loves you in your sin. That's fine. Like just, you know, it doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Like God loves you. That's, that's no problem. Like come and become a Christian. And then they come in and they give their heart to God. And we're like, whoa, now you have to be perfect. It's messed up. You look at the disciples, man. They're a hilarious bunch of imperfect Muppets. But... They followed Jesus. And at one point they pulled him aside because they were concerned by what he was saying. And they said, Jesus, we, we have left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, man, you, don't you worry. You will be well looked after. And that's where I want to finish it this morning. I want to encourage you. It's scary, this idea that I have to give God everything. But he's saying, don't worry. You will be well looked after I, I, I desperately want to be a part of a church that is filled with people that are on fire forget leading I just want to be a part of something significant I don't want to just come to church on a Sunday and sing some songs and 
make a few good points about something and then go home? What's that verse that Jesus said? Whoever holds on to their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. I just want to be a part of a group of people that are just sold out for Jesus. I said to God, like, why, why are you wanting us to focus so much on this discipleship thing? And uh, he said, because you need to get it right so that you can disciple people. And that's what we're, we're moving into. And again, I don't know, it could be five years away, it could be 10 years away, it could be 20 years away, it could be next week. All I know is that there are things happening around the world that haven't happened for a long time. And I don't think... I'm, Maybe it's because I have a soft spot for young adults because I am one. But um, all of you that laughed, that's mean. Do you guys, do you guys know you get older, but you still feel young? Do you guys notice that? What's that about? I still feel as young as I used to be, except smarter. Hey, John. I mean, John is young. He bikes everywhere. He's fitter than anybody here probably but young people in particular I don't know what's going on in the world today but it is the world has lost its mind and older people that can remember what it was like they have context so they can go I can tell the world's lost its mind because I remember what it was like when it was sane but young people you're growing up in this culture that's just you don't have any uh, for lack of a better word, what's that, what's that word, Ash, when you're doing an experiment and you have like, like a control group? You've got no control group as young people to go, yeah, the world's messed up, but I remember back in the 70s, whatever it might be, it was probably messed up in the 70s, actually. And so I just want to say to you young people, I think you're going to have to make a decision and you're going to have to be bolder and louder and stronger and braver and firmer than perhaps previous generations have had to be. Because the previous generations, I was talking to a pastor during the week, and he said, look, he said, mate, he's been pastoring for 10 years. He said, even the last two or three years are significantly harder than the previous seven because of what the world is saying about how we should live our life. I do not envy young people having to grow up, go to university, surround themselves with all the people that think the way it is. It's crazy. You will not survive unless you are connected to the source, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 28, He said, Go and make disciples. Does that sound like a suggestion, an invitation, a thought for you to mull over and decide whether you get on board with? Or does that sound pretty black and white? Go and make disciples. And in case you're unsure how to do that, He says, You teach them to obey everything. I have commanded. I'll finish with this. I might have said it a few times. This is the last thing for sure. This is another thing that God said during the week. He said, the key to discipleship is obedience. And the key to obedience is humility. I think that the church has lost a little bit of the fear and awe of God. Like He's great, He's loving, He's kind, He's compassionate, He's all of these things. But He's also the creator of the universe, powerful, beyond your wildest imagines powerful. Phenomenal cosmic powers. Everybody live in space. So it's an inappropriate quote from Aladdin. 
can't come to this church and not get in a, a Disney quote every now and again. I, I think sometimes we just, we fail to recognize that when God says, hey, do this, he's not, it's not me coming along and being like, hey, here's a good idea. Why don't you try this? It's not one of your mates. It's the creator of the universe saying, I am telling you to do this. Give that money. There's no debate. Just do it. Go talk to that person. I don't want an argument. Just do it. I think it might have been even Steve McCracken that said, you know, God said to Moses, I want you to do this. And Moses was like, I don't know if I want to do it. And at the end of it, God was like, you know what? I'm just going to kill him. Just that's that's how ticked off I'm now. I'm just gonna like, and I'm <laughs> reading into that. Well, I'm just saying, like, God is big, and when He says, "Hey, if you want to follow me, you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do this," don't think for a second that there's some kind of workaround, some kind of middle ground. Have a foot in both camps. Go to church on Sunday, and then I'll live my life during the week. Don't. I just save you a lot of heartache and pain and time. Just pick one. What did Jesus say? I'd rather you were hot or cold. Lukewarm just tastes gross. All right. I think I've said everything that God told me during the week. He just said right then, ugh, he just said, tell them, I love them. Man, I just, God, it's so clear. Tell them I love them. Everything I've said, I've said because He wants you. He loves you. He desires you. You are the apple of his eye. Died on a cross for you. It's wild. All right, I'm going to leave it there. What we'll do is we're going to we're just going to sing a song. You can just do what you want to do. You can sit there and reflect. You can sing if you want to sing. No, I want to do that one. Yeah, let's do it. I know you're going to have to change keys. Oh, is it? Wow. Shalom, shalom. Big peace to you. A lot of what I said today is just a repeat of last Sunday. But I repeated it because I felt strongly that God wanted us to receive it with the weight that it deserves. So as we sing this next song, I want you to just allow the weight to rest on you. The, the solemnness even of what we're talking about. I know it's not a normal Sunday morning. It's not a three-point message on how to make your relationships better or a four-point message on how to steward finance as well or whatever it might be. Is Denise still alive? No, she's all right. So the band's going to lead us in this song and, and you just do what you want to do. If you want to stand and sing, stand and sing. If you want to sit there quietly and not do anything, that is fine too. Too long. 
my fears are gone. You unravel. You unravel me with a melody. You, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer. I'm no Ian just popped up before and, and uh, said, hey, look, before you were speaking, this is what I had going through. My heart is that Bible verse where it says that a broken and contrite heart he will not despise. And maybe you're here this morning and you're just like, well, I, I want to do all that stuff, Josh, but I wouldn't even know where to start. I wouldn't even know where to start. Like, What's the first step to surrendering everything to him? And I want to tell you this morning that uh, I, I think it's different for everybody. I don't necessarily think that it's like a one-off decision that you make and then you walk out of here at you know 11.45 and you're like, well, now I've surrendered everything to God. I'm all good. I think it's, it's a process and it's a journey that you go on and, and the Holy Spirit works with you and He brings things up and He reveals things to you and He says, hey, what about this thing? Will you surrender that to me? And you go through that process and journey with Him of letting go and then He'll highlight something else. And 
So the question is, Lord, how do we, how do we respond to a message like this morning? And uh, a saying that I've used many times here before, might have even said it this morning, is that physical obedience brings spiritual release. It's something we see modeled in the Bible a lot where someone is asked to physically do something, whether it's to uh, go and wash at a particular pond, whether it's to go to a river and dunk themselves seven times, whether it's to eat a certain thing or whatever it might be, there is a spiritual release that comes after an act of physical obedience. And very often, the act of physical obedience is something that offends our intellect. Don't worry, that's, you're freaking out now. Don't panic. What's it going to get us to do? That's fine. What I want you to do is, as an act of physical obedience that brings spiritual release, if you're here this morning and you're going, okay, I want that. I don't know how to go about it. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't even know where to start, but I want that. I want to be this on fire, passionate, excited follower of Jesus Christ that is actively imitating his life and on a process to become a living copy of him. I want to be someone that's not taking God's suggestions or invitations or thoughts, but I'm actually receiving instructions from the creator of the universe and I'm acting on it. That's what I want to be. Then as just a, as a line in the sand act, I just want to invite you to come to the front. I'm inviting you, not instructing you. I invite you to come to the front. And it's just between you and God to say, I am going to go after this. If you feel like you need more time, if you're a, you know, more, uh, you process things differently, you might want to go home and mull it over. You know, Liz has got a beautiful story to tell about how she became a Christian. And it wasn't at a church. It wasn't at a morning like this. It was at home in her bedroom on a Tuesday or Wednesday night where she just in her own space and in her own time made that decision. But very often when there's a word delivered like this morning, there's an atmosphere and an environment that helps with change. Let's just sing the chorus again. All right. This is just between you and God.
Come on, just begin to lift up your voice this morning, church. Lift them up this morning. Who's got the next line? Sing it out. Come on, be bold. Just sing it out. You know the tune. You are holy. And you are holy. Oh, you. sing it, Stephen, you come here. Come on. Come on. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, hey, that's, that's us for this morning. If you're up the front and you want to stay up the front and you want to stay in just this mode of worship, we're going to keep the band on stage. We're just going to keep playing. But if you, if you feel like that's your Sunday done, then you are free to carry on with your day, carry on with your week. I just ask that if you do want to catch up with friends, that you go and do it out in the foyer. And we just keep that door closed if possible. But for those of us that are up the front that just want to stay just that little bit longer, you're welcome to stay. Yeah, so um, when I was on the floor, I was having an encounter. um, And what I saw um, was an extension of what I saw before when we stood at the edge of Egypt. And uh, I just saw... um, Everyone was sort of standing there and, and trying to decide how much to give over and what it would cost. I just felt the delight of the Father 
that people were ready to, to try. I saw some people taking things off their backs and taking things out of their pockets and dropping them on the ground behind them. And then I saw others throwing things out where the water had been split to test the ground, to sort of see what would happen if, if, um, if I stepped out there, would I be okay? And the Lord was just saying, it's okay to test the grounds. It's okay to test and ask and to wrestle and to struggle. Um, but it's okay to also walk because he's walking with us. He's walking before us. You know, Moses said, I didn't want to go anywhere if you're not going to be walking in front of us. You're not going to be with us. We're not going to go anywhere. And if you're worried about going somewhere where God's not going to be, don't be worried about that. If you're facing him, if you're focusing on him, if you're looking to him, that's there. And, and what I saw on the other side is um, I saw treasure chests. And when people were walking to the other side, they had new clothes to put on. I don't know if they're necessarily mantles or, 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 or giftings or... For some people, they seemed delighted because it was something that they had known or wanted or it, it fit them. It's almost like, oh, I've come home to the clothing. I've come home to the me. I've come home to the identity that I should be, that I've always wanted. It's almost like the, it was a, a coming home. There's things on the other side. When you let go of stuff here, when you let go of the fears, you let go of the worries, you let go of the what about how do I pay this? How do I do this? What, what am I going to do, Lord? When we let those things go and we just walk with Him, there's things that He gives back. And it's in abundance. But the interesting thing for me is many people, by the time they walked over to the other side, is they're picking up something that they should have had with them all the time and that was the word of God and the Lord's saying would you step into this promised land you need to step into it with my word and on my word it needs to be written in your heart and in your mind He's saying, grab my word because in there is all of the answers that you seek. And many have left that behind and not used it, not sought it, not chased it, not had it. It's dusty on the shelf. There's so much for us to, gra to, to grab. There's so much for us to chase. There's so much for us to have on the other side. But there's also a lot of stuff that we have to leave behind. Just spend the time with the Lord. And, and uh, if you're struggling with leaving something behind, fearful about how it's going to happen or, or whatever, just chat with Him. He'll show you. I, I remember when the Lord told me to, to write a letter to my dad about salvation and about God. And I was so concerned and so worried. And, and I was like, Lord, I don't know what to write. I don't, know how to, I don't know what to say to my dad. And he said, talk to him about his smoking. That's what's holding him back. My dad was started to smoke when he was eight. And he smoked for 50 years. And I said to my dad, Dad, if you're worried about having a relationship with God because you're still smoking. That's not an issue. I don't stop having a relationship with you because you smoke. And God's bigger than I am, better than I am. If he wants you to give that up, he'll help you. And my dad gave his heart to the Lord. And... Um, I don't know how long it was after that, maybe a few years at least, but he went cold turkey. And uh, that's it. 
the Lord helped him in that moment. So there's things sometimes that we're thinking, I can't come into a deeper relationship with you, Lord, because of this. It shouldn't stop us from coming to him. let go of something quite often there's a space and uh, I found in my own life that um, when I have to let go of something God I, I, I ask God and allow him to fill that space to fill that need because quite often I, I've picked that up or I've, I've got that for a reason it's, it's it can be a crutch it can be just filling a space and I just ask him to love me and I believe that's a key but when you're placing those things on the altar, one by one, ask Him to fill that space. Ask Him to meet the need in your heart. Ask Him to overwhelm you with His love. Because I tell you, perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. And we have a fear of letting go and moving forward. And it's just He wants to fill that space the space in our hearts and the space in our lives where we are just totally consumed by His love and we can be pour that out upon each other. We can pour it out and on, on our neighbours. That's the key. for a minute just to speak to those and I'm and I'm one of those who you know that when you break open that alabaster jar it's not going to smell pretty it's not going to smell like roses it's, that there's a stench of so many broken dreams so many broken promises and failed ventures and broken relationships. And that's all the more reason to break the thing open and get it out of your life. So many things that I've thought, this is it. This is, this is the dream. This is the purpose God has for me and it's just turned to dust and I know that we've all been there at some point in some way there's stuff that's just turned to crap and it's time to download it just get rid of it let it go lay it at the foot of the cross it can be different and I need to grab a hold of that what if grab a hold of God again grab a hold of the cord of faith it might be thin and it might be tenuous but it's real grab a hold of it again let go of that stuff the stuff that's held you back the stuff that's said you're not worth it. You can't do it. Look at it. Look at all this broken stuff you've messed up. And today, God says, just lay that down. Let it go. As Gene just said, this, He's a God of grace and mercy and of the second chance and the third chance and the 37,000. 327th chance let go of this break the stinking rubbish and let it go and 
let release into God and march out into that into that promised land across that way through the Jordan. It's here for you. I don't here for you right now. Let me just read this scripture out and then we'll, we'll end it. Psalms 51, 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You know, this is a psalm written by David. And what's fascinating it is he recognizes that he doesn't have anything that he needs. He can't bring the change about himself. He goes to God and he says, you need to create in me a pure heart. You need to renew a steadfast spirit within me. You need to restore to me the joy of your salvation and you need to grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. It's fascinating to me that David puts the onus on God even to the point that he says it's your job to give me the spirit to be willing to go on this journey. A little bit further down the same chapter, he says, open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Even there, he says, God, it's your job to open my lips. He says, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Father, I just lift every single person up that's been a part of this morning or watching online or even watching afterwards or listening later. God, we ask that you would create in us a pure heart. I pray for every single person here that you would renew a steadfast spirit within them. You would restore to us the joy of our salvation. And you would grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. Lord, we humble ourselves before you this morning. We just acknowledge that you are the King of kings. You are the name above all names, Lord. And when you tell us to go, we will go. When you tell us to wait, we will wait. Lord, we just repent of just diminishing your instruction down to an optional invitation. Lord, teach us your ways, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much everyone that has stuck around. I know that some people had to get away and babies and things. We're doing all right? Yeah, Julie, you okay? Yeah? It's a bit of a different one this morning. God loves you. Amen. Underneath everything that was said, everything that happened, God loves you. 
You guys want to hear a joke? <laughs> Told this to my kids during the week. They didn't think it was funny. I thought it was hilarious. What's ET short for? Because he's got little legs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to get a drum kit just so we can do that. Boom, boom, psh. Oh dear. All right. Have fun. God loves you. Have a good week.